Okay, now uh, I want to welcome you back from a long weekend. Uh, and because of those slackers in the afternoon class, you guys got last Thursday off. So I didn't have to do that, but I wanted to do it. So, so we had a week off from classes. Nice. Uh, I went to the game last Thursday night, by the way. Raise your hand if you went to the game. I did. I had a lot of fun. Although it was a nightmare. Uh, Trent. No, I, I had a lot of fun at the game. But getting to the stadium was a nightmare because I parked at over in the research park. They had park and ride over there. Shuttle bus. Oh, really convenient. No, you park way over there. Not too much traffic. They have a shuttle bus. Tyler, and you get in the shuttle bus, it drives you right up to the stadium. Yeah, so they drove me to the UCF bus stop, which is a mile from the stadium. <laughs> so then, after the, after the game, they're supposed to have, the shuttle's supposed to go to parking lot C, you know, over by the uh, garage C, okay, parking garage C. So I walk, so after the game, I think, all right, I'm going to go over there and get it because they probably just, some new guy, he probably blew it, dropped me off at the UCF bus stop. So I walk over to parking lot C, right? And I'm thinking, okay, good, I'll get him. It's two-thirds of a mile to the parking lot C from the stadium, at least from the north end zone where I was. So then I get to the to the, that parking lot, and there's this little guy, you know, with a little orange vest, you know, the little eye visibility vest from the trans one of the drivers and he says well you can't get the bus here you have to walk all the way to the physical sciences building you know the shuttle bus stop over there you know by the counseling center and the physics the physical side so that's a full mile from the stadium <laughs> some shuttle service anyway um let's recap last time uh we were talking about this idea uh, you know, this basic task of science. How do you predict the future state of your physical system? For instance, if you're a chemist, you want to be able to predict how quickly your chemical reaction will go. Will it take a second? Will it take a microsecond? Or will it take a year? Now, all those are legitimate chemical reaction times. Okay, similarly, for something simple, like a hound dog on a skateboard or a student on a skateboard, um, you know, it's nice to be able to predict that kind of thing too. So let's look at what we went over last time. And this is the criteria, these are the criteria uh, by which Galileo and his uh, followers, of which we are followers, we're part of that set, uh, Galileo and his followers, all the students of Galileo, uh, needed to figure these things out in order to predict the state of motion of a simple system at some future time. For instance, you have to know the initial position. So x, y, and z coordinates at time t equals zero in some coordinate system. See, so like for us, it was, you know, Tyler in the back. In the afternoon lecture, it's Caitlin in the back. And... You know, you have to set that up in order, in order to make measurements and be systematic about it. You have to, you know, know the initial position. And, you know, Sir Isaac Newton over here, he was a, you know, you guys are students of Galileo, and so was Sir, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton took his hat off to Galileo, and we all do. We all should anyways. The other thing that you want to figure out or you want to know is initial velocity. And what that means is that at time t equals zero, in other words, when Tyler says go, that's when everybody started their clocks, their timers. You want to know these three components of the velocity, vx, vy, and vz. And it's best if it's in the same coordinate system with which you know uh, the... Uh, position. All right, now, for those of you that are not used to this notation, the uh, notation with a subscript x, v subscript x, uh, stands for the component of the velocity 
that's parallel to the x-axis. So for us in class last time, you know, when we were doing those measurements and stuff, you know, I had my big tape measure and we had timers, Michaela and uh, Jacqueline uh, and, and Austin uh, doing the timing. Um, we set up this, they, they, the skateboarders basically just went down the ramp. So they went down along the x-axis. So they had a component vx, but vy was zero and vz was zero on the coordinate axis that we chose, a slanted x-axis. Okay, now, if you want to set up your coordinate system down here in the front, where your x-axis goes left and right, and your y-axis goes straight up and down, like this, and your z-axis goes out, you know, straight, straight ahead of me and straight back behind me, you know, you can do that too. And then you'll have a mixture of components. But for the simple system that we had, VX was the only component we had in that example. Now, we'll have other examples. For instance, if you have a baseball uh, that's heading for the outfield, it's going to have a little bit of X component and a little bit of vertical Y component. That's how it goes up into the sky. But then it comes back down. Um, see ya, Darian. Uh, and so... You know, some systems that you're talking about have several components. And the spacecraft heading for Mars or heading for the moon or something like that or heading up to Earth orbit, you need all three coordinates. Now, the third thing that you need to know is some formula uh, by which the system evolves over time. And that is known by the time evolution equations. Uh, and another way of describing it is equation of motion. And it's interesting that, you know, and, and I've got plural for both of those, uh, equation or plural equations, uh, because sometimes, for instance, if you're trying to figure out a black hole detonating a, uh, a phase transition in the early universe, yeah, you can do that and you have to have several equations of motion. And they're all coupled together, and they're really sticky and tough to, to work with, but you can work them out. For us guys, we're going to have something fairly easy. And this is the basic task for today. The equation of motion for a simple accelerating system like the skateboarder or like an apple dropping out of an apple tree. Now, a couple things about notation. Um, the position vector is sometimes expressed as a, the letter R with an arrow over the top of it. And that stands for the set of three numbers that give its position. And, the, you know, so you, your, your X, Y, and Z coordinate system, you have to know, you know, is, is your unit of measurement one mile? Or is it one block? Or is it one foot? or one meter or what you know we were uh, we actually started with inches and converted to meters okay but an astronomer might think in terms of light years so you know but everything's gonna have a position something like that now the velocity is also a vector and I've already mentioned that you express its three-dimensional its spatial orientation and size uh, with the components Vx, Vy, and Vz. All right? And a lot of times you'll see a, the letter V with an arrow over the top of it. And that means you're talking about something that has a size and a direction. All right? Now, as I mentioned last time, uh, velocity has a speed and a direction. The speed is considered to be a scalar quantity. Okay, it's a number. So uh, one of the other forms of notation, in, if you're working with a vector, um, is, okay, you can use an arrow over the top, or you can make it bold face, okay? And on a chalkboard, you know, you can make things chalkboard bold face. I'll show you that. Next time I'm working on the document cam, I'll show you that. Anyways, these are two. So you can either use a bold face V it's hard to tell on the projector. This speed V is not bold faced. 
this velocity v down here is bold face. I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, and then this V here, it's really dark and thick. That's the Rockwell Extra Bold uh, font, which is by um, default uh, a bold face font. So that's just by way of notation. Um, these, you know, so sometimes I'll use this, and sometimes I'll, you'll, I'll use bold face. So try to remember that. And it's definitely something that's important for us. So position is a vector, but distance is a scalar. And you compute distance um, between two position vectors. So you have an arrow pointing to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and an arrow pointing to Dubuck, Iowa. And you can compute the distance between the tip of those two arrows, you know, one, you know, and there, let's say that the, the origin of coordinates is St. Louis. Okay, so St. Louis, you got an arrow that lands at Dubuck, Iowa, a little bit further up the uh, Mississippi River. And then you have another one uh, heading a little bit northeast over to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay, that's two different arrows. The tail of them is in St. Louis. The tip of them is in Milwaukee and and then the other one is in Dubuck, Iowa, and you can figure out, you know, you just use the Pythagorean theorem, and we'll do that from time to time. See this little kitty cat over here? You notice anything about that kitty cat? What do you see? Come on, scientific observers. He's, this is on Reddit yesterday. Whose pancakes is he looking at? <laughs> He's looking at his <laughs> at his master's pancakes. He doesn't care about his. He's looking He's looking at these ones up here. These are his. Me? He's looking at the big ones. I thought that was kind of funny. Okay, velocity is a vector, as I've mentioned already. Speed is a scalar. And it is also computed not from two different positions, but from two different sets of speed and time, or excuse me, distance and time measurements, which we did um, several times uh, last week, and you did for homework. And we're going to talk about some of those data here in just a minute. Now, a uh, final note on this topic, the direction of the position vector and the velocity vector, um, you figure out, if, you, if you're trying to figure out the exact number of degrees, uh, you have to use a little trig. Now, we're not going to use any trig other than Pythagorean theorem in this class. So don't worry about figuring out the number of degrees. But if you graph something out, sometimes you can graph it out and get a rough estimate, you know, northwest or southeast or, or straight east. Those are fine. So in our class, direction-wise, graph it out as well as you can. If you have graph paper, you can do it nicely. And, then, and I always try to do my... Uh, vectors and stuff as carefully as I can uh, using the built-in pixel uh, structure of my keynote application. Uh, so I always know what it is. And But you guys could just go kind of with the visual direction. North, northeast, east, southeast, south, southwest, west, northwest, and back to north. So those should be sufficient. Now, um, Here's our basic task for today. We want to figure out this basic question. And we're going to look at Jacob number one. Uh, and, you know, we could look at the other ones, but this, this one's going to be the most conducive to our study of figuring out how the motion evolves over time. And after we're done, we'll be able to put together an equation of motion or the time evolution equation uh, for a skateboarder. All right, so let's take a look at this data and double check it in your notes. Everyone here, uh, well, most of you were here last time, last Tuesday. Uh, here's Tyler. Tyler's up there at the start, so he's 0, comma 0 for time and position. Then there's Austin, and recopy this if you don't have it, because we're going to do some calculations with it. 
uh, in just a minute and have your eye clicker as well by the way get your click your calculator out as well uh, you're gonna need both of those babies uh, here's Jacqueline Jacqueline where are you at today Jacqueline Meister Ooh. Jacqueline's sorry about that Jacqueline Austin are you here okay Austin good and here's Michaela. Michaela, you're here, right? Michaela. Oh, we've got some absentee, le absentee students here. Anyways, here's the data. Uh, this was on your notes. I copied it onto my uh, document cam file for you. And let's take a look at some of the things that we know. This is Jacob's first run. Jacob, are you here? Yeah, okay, Jacob's here. Now, one thing that we know, this is this column here, the average speed, uh, that was one of your tasks. Although I, I don't think I asked this. Uh, did you guys have Jacob number one? Okay. All right. So you figured out speeds and stuff. Um, here are the average speeds. And... So one thing we know is this speed is changing. All right. It, in other words, it's evolving over time. So we want to try and figure out some kind of a mathematical expression that expresses and describes uh, exactly, if possible, the evolution over time uh, of uh, the skateboarder. Okay, so... Uh, what we're going to do now is calculate delta V. So here are the average V's uh, in this column. And let's, let's calculate delta V from those. Um, we're going to go uh, delta V between Austin and Jacqueline. And then we're also going to do a delta V. And we're going to do this on clickers. All right. So uh, make sure you have this data copied into your notebook or make sure you have your notebook open to last Tuesday's notes and then have these average V's penciled in there somewhere so we're going to do two of them and what we're going to do my wonderful students we're going to use clickers the first question is going to be multiple choice but then the second one you're going to type in the number we're going to try out a numeric question okay should be good uh, should work good Raise your hand if you're on frequency BB and you got the go nitro. Okay. All right. So everybody turn your rig on uh, and uh, go to frequency BB if you're not already. And let's try get my cursor back. Question number one. Delta V for the interval between Austin and Jacqueline. Now you just had that data up there, so hopefully you copied it and, and you can do that. Is anybody getting uh, no base? Great. All right, 15 seconds. What? Oh, the screen. <sighs> Tell you. Five. Four, three, two, one, zero. And by the way, uh, I synchronized the roster last night. So um, if you registered prior to about 8 o'clock last night, uh, you should be on the roster. And, and this is our first official clicking. It was supposed to be last Thursday, but then we had to cancel last Thursday. So this is our first official clicking. 
So you want to make sure that you're clicking as uh, answering each question as carefully as ever you can. Uh, and if you do that, you'll be cooking good. All right, so let's see what you guys have got. Okay, here there seems to be a little bit of controversy. Um, most of you did uh, select the correct answer, 0 0.70. It's simply the difference between those two. Um, it's simply the difference between those two. So now, you know, so 2.67 minus 0. Uh, excuse me, minus 1.97. All right. Now, uh, let's go to uh, the next screen. Okay, here's a little kitty cat. Now, we're going to do a numeric question. So when you switch from multiple choice to numeric, you have to hit the blue refresh key. Okay, so do that right now. And now I'm going to start a numeric question for you and you're going to type in the answer for this one Jacqueline to Michaela and here's the data but you hopefully you have the Delta V's uh, that you need so type in it type in your answer to the nearest one hundredth of a meter per second Uh, let me hit the refresh button. Oh, how do you do that? Uh, you use the um, up and down. It's kind of like an old-time cell phone where you have to hit the, the buttons more than once to get different characters. So if you hit the down arrow key, hit the down arrow key and you'll get numbers. And then go to the right to type in your next number. And students, I'm going to turn the lights up really high because... The decimal point is really bad. It's really hard to see. The decimal point is in there. And let's see if I can do mine. Oh, and by the way, you have to type the zero. If you have a, a number between zero and one, you have to type in zero point something. You can't just type in the decimal point. And then when you're finished, when you have your number in there, something, point, something, something, hit the send key. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And, uh, Oops, let me go back to this. Okay, be aware of that. That decimal point is kind of nasty. Uh, okay, so here's the correct answer, uh, 0 0.53. Uh, and most of you got that. 67%. Now, I'm going to look through here. I can actually see different answers. Okay. 
see, look at this, 2.53. Uh, that's possibly a typo, one person. A lot of, and, and, and just so you know, the session, the, the software generates a spreadsheet of what everybody in here types and hits the send key for. So, it, so for multiple choice, it'll record A, B, C, D, and whatever it is. But on numerical, it'll tell me the actual, the, it'll tell me the first number you send. And then it'll type in. The, it'll tell the last number. So if you change your mind, it'll show me what you typed in first. And if you change your mind, it'll also show me what you type in second. Anyway, so what I can do sometimes is look at the data here. And see now here, look at that, three point five three, five three. That's pro. This is probably somebody that couldn't see that little teeny decimal point. And it's it's pathetic, uh, it's really bad. Uh, if matter of fact, that might have been me. I I think I did the right thing, but it's kind of hard to tell even up here. Anyway, so uh, so that's good. Now here's a problem, and I want you to think about this carefully. It was an equal distance from Austin down to Jacqueline. From Jacqueline down to Michaela, it was an equal distance. All right. But notice that the delta V was not even close to being equal. All right. And so, but but here's the thing about it. You know, we've got this, uh, you know, this conundrum here. Uh, but we we're going to try to tackle this. So make a note. Um, delta V's, Austin to, J to Jacqueline, Jacqueline to Michaela, don't make sense distance-wise. But there might be some other method that does make them sensible. In other words, that they do fit a pattern, not spatially by distance, but maybe some other method. And we're going to figure that out in just a second. Hit the refresh key again, because now we're going back to multiple and for multiple choice, you got to hit the... So whenever you switch from one mode to the other, you got to hit the refresh key. And you're good. So let's take a look at the problem. Here's the problem. And you can add this to your notes, uh, your data table, wherever you have it. This is... Get my cursor over here. Here it is. Okay, this is an average speed. So, just like the tortoise and the hare, you know, knowing the average speed and knowing the actual speed are two different things. All right, so if you have an instantaneous actual speed of one mile an hour for an hour, then that means you're, you know, it's easy to predict how far, but if you, if you if your average speed goes up and back down or excuse me if your instantaneous speed goes up and back down you know you might have an average I mean even you could even go backwards that would count as a negative uh, speed you know if you're going backwards so if you're you're heading you know heading to point B and you turn around and go backwards for a, for a minute or two that would be a negative velocity a backwards velocity but and that would add in and that would change your average velocity so so because the speed is changing the actual instantaneous speed is not the average speed at the time that the skateboarder passes so at time t equals 1.82 he's got a speed the skate jacob's got a speed but this ain't it all right and at time t equals 3.16 when he passes Jacqueline he has a speed but this ain't it and same thing down here for for um, for uh, Michaela but we're going to figure this out and I'm going to ask you another question here here it is and I want you to read it carefully if this if the skateboarder accelerates smoothly and uniformly all the way down in other words if he doesn't do anything except roll straight you know he doesn't hit the brakes he doesn't hit his jet pack you know he doesn't just rolls 
Okay, let me start this question for you. Uh, then we can get an idea of average speed and instantaneous speed. This guy was on Reddit a couple months ago. Under what the... Because it's somebody, it's somebody that doesn't under, doesn't understand English very good, I guess. Anyway, 15 seconds to vote. What is the average speed for this time interval? Hopefully this is easy for you to calculate. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All right, 296 students. Great. Uh, let me see what you guys have got. Uh-oh. We've got some controversy here. Um, yeah, add them up and divide by two. It's basically your theory here. So, so the correct answer is six. And most of you, a majority of you got it right. I don't know how you get four. Uh, if you voted for these two, or this one, see, this is, this number here, 12.0, that's the sum of the two velocities, uh, but that's not the average. The average is add them up and divide by two, if you have two, and that's what we have, we have two. All right, so let me move this. Now, we're going to build on this concept. Uh, let me get my cursor back. Come on, cursor. Here we go. Um, let's do this question. Same skateboarder, but now I'm asking you at what time on the time axis? And now I've got a graph there. Go ahead and sketch that. Add that to your notes because we're going to talk about that. At what time is the instantaneous speed equal to the average? Six. Six point zero zero. Oh, sorry. Let me start the question. Okay, now you can vote. Very good. Okay, 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what we got. Uh, yeah, okay. And 95% uh, of you voted correctly. And the reason for that is the answer is down here at the bottom. Um, and here it is. Go ahead and add to your sketch, you know, a little star or something right here. Hey, you guys, look at what I'm talking about. Come on, don't, don't be blabbing. Add a little star to your diagram, your graph of speed versus time. That's an important time for us because, in general, the instantaneous speed will be equal to the average at that halfway time. If, and, and make a, a side note, a big if, if it is smoothly accelerating. Now, if you have something that's herky-jerky, like the hair in the, in the tail of the tortoise and the hare, 
uh, no. But if you have something smoothly accelerating, like a skateboarder rolling nice and easy down the aisle, or an apple falling down out of an apple tree, nice and easy, uh, then you have instantaneous speed equal to the average at the moment of time halfway through the interval. All right. Now, here's your equation of motion in general. If it's smoothly accelerating, the amount of time, the amount of uh, extra speed you get is just a multiple of the amount of time that it accelerates. And this is what will make the um, uh, Jacob number one data makes sense okay the fact that the delta v the change in the velocity change in speed is equal to some number a times delta t and a is known as the acceleration right? and we're going to be working on that in just a second here uh, so let's check out this graph of speed versus time it is important okay so here's our first speed versus time graph and this one is the cinchiest one of all, constant speed. Okay, so draw in a time axis horizontally and give me a speed axis vertically that goes positive and negative. So this would be like uh, backwards. The negative numbers would be backwards. And the positive numbers would be forward. Okay, so if you're moving forward, you're up here. Now, this is the graph, the dotted line here is a graph of somebody that's on cruise control, one meter per second. All right, now it's like about two miles an hour, two point something miles an hour. So they're just kind of poking down the highway. But anyway, so that's cruise control, constant speed. All right, and let's just follow this guy. Let's follow his uh, evolution for two and a half seconds. So from time t equals zero here to time t equals 2.5 seconds here. Uh, let's just, you know, so let's, there's his graph. All right, now what happens after 2.5, we're not going to talk about. You know, he might hit the gas or, or what have you. But for these two and a half seconds, uniform speed. And his speed is one meter per second. So it's just a a flat line up here at the at the one unit level on the speed axis all right now I want you to shade in a rectangle this rectangle the top of it is that dotted line graph that's the actual graph and drop two horizontal lines to form the sides of the rectangle at 2.5 seconds and at zero seconds, that'll be the v-axis anyway, so you already have that one. Okay. And then just kind of shade it in or something, you know, or put dots in it or something. to high, Or if you have a highlighter, high, color it in with your highlighter. Okay. Now, the area of that rectangle is pretty important to us. All right. The area of a rectangle in general is base times height. And for this one, the base is 2.5 seconds. And the height is 1 meter per second. So it's not a, a height in inches. And it's not a width in inches or centimeters or anything. Its width is a time measurement. Okay. And it's, that's like your delta T. And its height is your delta V, only there's no delta V here. So, okay, it's your V. It's one meter per second. Hey, uh, let me ask you a question. This guy's going along at one meter per second for two and a half seconds. How far does he go? Two and a half meters. Yeah, it's easy, right? So it's two and a half times. So basically, the area, go ahead and cancel seconds, okay? The area of this thing is actually equal to 
not square meters, not square centimeters, not square. It's actually equal to meters. Now, that tells you that you have an abstract graph. This is not like a graph on regular XY graph paper. You know, so if you have a, a right triangle or any triangle on graph paper, your area is going to be square centimeters or square inches or something, you know, depending on what you use for your graph paper. Okay, but on this graph, this is an abstract speed versus time graph. It's not something that you can see, you know, in a classroom, but it's something that you can construct in an abstract sense and map out uh, on graph paper under the proviso that your vertical axis is not the y-axis but the speed axis. And your horizontal axis is not the x-axis but the time axis. And then the area is the distance traveled. So, and in general, this it, it, it's, it is perfectly fine to, to interpret that area as the distance traveled. Okay, so make a note of that. Okay, it's the area between the graph itself, the dotted line, and the time axis, and then vertical lines left and right. That graph, whatever it happens to be. Now, if your speed is changing, you won't have a flat line. You'll have, you know, it'll be going up or going down or something like that, but you can still use the same philosophy. And that's what we're going to do now. Okay, now we're going to have a velocity graph for something slowing down. Here's a little, here's kind of like a little uh, artificial strobe photograph of something slowing down. You know, a strobe photograph, it shows you a flash photography every, you know, like hundredth of a second or every thousandth of a second. And it can slow down the motion of a hummingbird or a dragonfly, you know, so you can see individual wing strokes of the hummingbird and it's pretty cool and so the same thing here if you take a flash here a flash here if it's slowing down the uh, red dot here is going to get uh, closer and closer together uh, from one dot to the next and so this is a sign of something slowing down so let's look at that in a case like this you're going to get a triangle now let's look at this one all right go ahead and draw in your another velocity graph, another speed graph, and with some plus and some minus. All right, so this one starts out going three miles an hour, but slows down. And notice that it's slowing down uniformly. It's a straight line, smooth and nice. And let's say that it slows down to zero in four seconds. All right. Now this is kind of like the the speed graph that we had on the last two clicker questions. You know, we had some speed, and that one was speeding up. This one's slowing down; it's getting smaller, but it's between two different times. All right. Now the area between the dotted line here and the time axis. And then vertical lines left and right. Now you don't need one on the uh, on the right, but you do need one on the left, and that's the v-axis. And I've shaded it in in blue. And we can interpret that area as the distance traveled. All right. So as this thing uh, moves from three meters per second to two meters per second to one meter per second to zero in four seconds um, it's going to cover ground but it's going to be like this previous slide you know this one here here it's really whipping so from for the first second from a to b it's really moving it's covering ground but then down here from d to e the last interval of time the, the fourth second i guess if you want uh it's just kind of poking along and same thing here so let's take a look at this. Now, a triangle, the area is not base time height. It's one-half base time height. It's basically a rectangle split in half diagonally. That's why I have a one-half there. All right. So there's your, there's your basic, you know, so hopefully everybody recalls that from geometry class. 
And in our case, um, the height, or excuse me, the base is four seconds, and the height is three meters per second. That's the height of the rectangle. All right, it's a right triangle. Now, if you don't have a right triangle, you can, you know, you can break an obtuse triangle up into a bunch of right triangles. Usually, it's a little bit of work. Now, this one's a right triangle, so it's one half base time type, easy to understand. All right, so let's let's do a little bit of fancy dancy with those numbers. Put that factor of one half as a denominator under the speed, three meters per second divided by two. And we'll leave this four meter or the four second base uh, by itself. So we're going to leave that as four, and but we're going to park that factor of one half and convert it into this denominator of two. So that's kosher. That's normal. Okay. And here's a little IQ test question for you. What is this quantity? What should we call that? It, does it have a name? What is that? Raise your hand if you want to make a bold stab at an answer. No? No bold stabs? How about a timid dab? How about a scaredy cat blip? Anybody have? Nobody in here is bold. Ah, we got one bold student. Yes. It's a speed. It's a, that that quotient, that quotient there, that little fraction. It's going to have the word speed in it. Yeah, it's the average speed. Ding 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 ding. Is that what you were going to say? Good. Yeah, it's an average speed. All right. Now that's. So let's check this out. Delta t times average speed. And students, this is a this is a kosher formula. For the distance of a smoothly accelerating object. So a skateboarder coming smooth and nice down the aisle, an apple's dropping smooth and nice out of an apple tree. The average speed times the elapsed time, delta t. All right, now put a star next to that because that's one of our uh, formulas. With that, we can figure out the distance traveled. Basically, we've tackled a uh, distance triangle. Now, average speed for a smoothie. Uh, if something's accelerating, what what's the change in the speed equal to? What did we just say for the equation of motion? Change of speed, delta V is... Yeah, it's a delta it's a delta t okay so the average speed is actually a delta t over 2 all right cuz you know the acceleration you know so many you know meters per second for every second of acceleration So now, this formula here, a delta t over 2, that uses our equation of motion and the idea of average speed. Question? Acceleration. A stands for acceleration. All right? So the average speed is a delta t over 2. And that means that the distance, now we're going to plug this in to the distance equation. And look at what we got. Now, we still have delta t that we started with, but now we have another delta t in there. So that means I've got a delta t quantity squared. 
And my wonderful students, that is the general equation for the position. That's the time evolution equation for something that's under an acceleration. If it starts from zero with zero speed, and if it's already moving and then starts to slow down, things are a little tougher. But in general, that's your distance triangle. And so it's based on uh, this formula here is for any, ex so if we could figure out the acceleration, and I'm going to set up homework four for you tonight so that, yes, you can figure out an acceleration for Jacob number one, Jacob's first run. Okay, we're going to use his, because there's a lot of slop in the data. If you look at it carefully, if you look at the delta Vs, and then do what we do tonight for homework for the other three runs in this class and then all four runs in the afternoon class. It looks really sloppy and nasty except for Jacob's first run. So Jacob's first run, we, we hit everything right. So this is the fo general formula. Now, if you're, if you're dropping, the symbol that we use for the acceleration due to gravity is G. And I don't have it on the slide, but I want you to write it down. For every second of free fall, the falling object acquires 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. if it is dropping. Let me repeat that for you. In free fall, for every second of free fall, the falling object acquires 9.8 meters per second of additional speed downward. If it's moving downward, Variation number, so so G is equal to, here's your number for G. G is equal to 9.8 meters per second per second. Okay? 9.8 meters per second per second. Uh, in other words, 9.8 meters per second squared. That's another more compact way to express that. 9.8 meters per second squared. Now let me uh, give you the variation of that long sentence. Think of a baseball, a pop-up. If, if it's a real pop-up, it goes straight up and straight down. Okay. A baseball pop-up or any vertical motion upward. For every second of upward motion... the object loses 9.8 meters per second of upward speed as long as it's still moving upward. Right? So on the way up, every second it loses 9.8 meters per second of upward speed. So if it starts with 20, after one second it's down to 10.2. Let me repeat that. If the pop-up starts with 20 meters per second of upward speed, and that's a normal speed for a baseball, so it starts with 20 meters per second at time t equals zero. At time t equals one second, it's down to nine. It's down to 10.2 meters per second. Still going up, but it's down to 10.2. After two seconds, it's down to 0.4. So it's its time to get to the very top of its motion is about two point something seconds. And it takes another two seconds to go downward. 
because it's one of those those areas where the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. He's taketh thing away. Gravity's taketh thing away on the way up, but giveth thing on the way back down. So the the amount of time it takes to go up is the same as the amount of time it takes to go down. And now that's neglecting air resistance. So, but uh, if you're a baseball, it's going to take roughly the same amount of time to go up as it takes to come down. So let me repeat that for the baseball. On the way up, for every second of upward travel, the baseball loses 9.8 meters per second of whatever upward speed it's got if it's going upward. Right? So if you're going upward, you're losing. If you're going downward, you're gaining. Okay? And that's what gravity does. So G is 9.8 meters per second per second 9.8 meters per second squared so if you figure out how much time you are so for instance if you're on top of the library the UCF library and you're up there about I don't know 50 feet 60 feet okay that's about 20 meters 20 something meters that's going to take you a second or so to drop down you know if so if you if you toss A water balloon, okay. Toss a water balloon. You, you know, you're holding it out. You see, you know, you see your your best friend down below. And you're gonna get him good because it's a hot day, so you're doing him a favor, right? Okay, so you, you're holding it out there. You just wait for it to time it just right, and you let it go, and down it goes. It's gonna take a couple seconds, a second or two. From the from the library, I'd say about one point something seconds, and you can figure out exactly what it is. Matter of fact, maybe for homework, we'll do that. Figure out exactly how long it takes. That would be a brain burner. And as you know, a brain burner is on every midterm. Right, Shy? At least one or two. Uh, so, all right, so to repeat, in fr and, and we consider the upward baseball and the downward falling object, the apple falling, we consider both of those to be in free fall in quotation marks. Only one of them is falling, but we still say it's free fall. On the way up, you lose 9.8 meters per second for every second you're in free fall. On the way down, you gain 9.8 meters per second downward for every second you're, you're falling. Now, uh, here's what the speed triangle or the distance triangle would look like. Let's just fill this out. Okay, so it's got a little different time scale and everything here. Okay, let's go two seconds. And so this is like something falling off the uh, top of the, this. So this is like the water balloon. All right. So you have in one second. You're now going downward at 9.8 meters per second. So now the top half of this graph is upward speed, right? Positive V. And the, the lower half is downward speed. So you're dropping a water balloon, you're gaining speed. So after one second, you're at 9.8 meters per second of downward speed, right? After a, another second, you're at negative 19 point. You're really starting to whip. That's about 40 miles an hour. Okay? So, now here's your graph. Okay? The assumption is if there's no wind and there's no air resistance and stuff, and if something's going really fast, like an artillery shell or, you know, Brett Favor throwing a. F Did you know that Brett Favor has the best fastball of any just about any athlete it's, it's phenomenal better than anybody in in major league baseball way more yeah favor has way more kinetic energy on his or used to anyways so anyway so here's so this is going about 40 miles an hour 19.6 downward right now here's your area okay and the area for that is you just you know so 2 squared, your, your time is 2. So 2 seconds, quantity squared, that would be 4 seconds squared. And then 9.8 meters per second squared. 
So what's 4 times 9.8? It's about 39.2. 4 times 9.8. 39.2? 39.2. Okay, now, and then one half, half of that. Now divide that by two. Okay, so that'll be 19.6 meters. So that's about the, so I don't know, that's approximately the height of the library. I don't know what the official height is, but it's close to 20 meters. Okay. How did I get what? G? 9.8. Yeah, G is the G is the special sim because we use a lot of free fall calculations and stuff in physics because we're you know we're always operating near the surface of the Earth so this acceleration is everywhere and so we have a give it a special symbol but if you're on a tabletop you know and you're accelerating a train or you know or anything horizontally you just use the letter A you know you don't use G for that question. Yeah, positive G and negative G. Right now, let's think of G as being a positive number, 9.8 meters per second squared. And I think I'll give you the minus sign. I'll permission to use minus signs on it on Thursday. All right. It's a drop distance. It's how far below the drop point you've gone. All right, now, I'm going to... I'm going to dismiss you now, and we're going to have some drop distance questions on homework four. That will be available by supper time, if not sooner, due on Thursday. You're dismissed.